Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, second and uh, final session on the webinar series for adolescents. My name is Catherine Cora. I am the coordinator for the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management. I'm really excited to be discussing this topic. I will share screen. Um, and so the topic of today is on teen anxiety and resilience. And uh, oh my goodness, is this uh, such a um, high level request theme. Uh, so many people ask me questions on this um, about making sense of, of, of anxiety in adolescence and how do we address it and so forth. Um, before I move on to the presentation though, I just wanted to mention for those who may have missed it, that uh, back in December, um, I did do a presentation, kind of like an introduction to adolescence, demystifying the journey of adolescence. And so if you have not um, attended to it or have not seen it, um, the recording is available off of our website and on our YouTube channel. So I invite you to go and take a look at that. So with no further ado, let's start the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I love to start with key insights in terms of alarm and anxiety. And so the first one, uh, and you'll notice I'll, in, I'll, uh, I will be using the word alarm more than anxiety, and I'll explain why in a, in a moment. Um, and so alarm is a natural and necessary emotion that protects us from danger. And so understanding that we all have an alarm system, um, whether we're a child, an adolescent, or an adult, and so um, our system is made such in order to survive, uh, and it is quite normal and natural for us to react to a threatening situation. The second key insight um, is that uh, anxiety cannot be addressed uh, by focusing on the symptoms directly. Um, I have colleagues that work in, uh, as uh, psychotherapists and psychologists, and uh, CBT is a very popular approach for, um, for anxiety. And one of the things that my colleagues have come to recognize uh, over the years is that CBT is, is, is not necessarily the best approach for, for all, especially for more immature um, adolescents, those who have a harder time having perspective. Um, sometimes those that are very defended, CBT can be very confronting. And so to have a more alternative approach that is, is uh, you know, in the play mode, um, something that's not as direct, not about your thinking, but about your experiential and, your, and you're talking about your emotions, um, can be a, a much more helpful approach. And of course, I'm now talking about psychotherapy, but of course, none of you are meant to do therapy in schools with students. And so what can we do as adults to help support students in the education setting? Um, so we'll definitely talk about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, a quick quote here, just to kind of support uh, the, the, the insight number two, is that beneath every behavior is a feeling, and beneath every feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause, not the symptom. And so the idea here is to make sense of what's the need for the student behind the alarm, behind some of the, this reaction and so forth, and how can we address that need at a deeper level? The third <clears throat> key insight is that some individuals are more at risk for developing uh, alarm and anxiety problems. Um, of course, any of our students that are on the sensitivity spectrum, whether it is autism or that is on um, giftedness uh, continuum or any type of sensory, <clears throat> sorry guys, I kind of have a cold, in terms of sensory, that that plays into it. Um, genetics also plays into it um, in terms of, um, you know, tr if you think about trauma and, and that can be passed down, there's research that has shown that trauma can be passed down um, genetically. Um, and of course, the environmental stress. And so all of us know, and now that we're third year into COVID, um, all of the, the chronic kind of toxic stress that we've been going through, how that has an impact on our alarm system. And of course, for our students, um, same is, is uh, true too. And I don't know for you guys, but I know for me, working with staff that work with students, I definitely have noticed an increase in, in alarm and anxiety in students uh, across the board in all ages um, and gender and so forth. And so um, we definitely see the impact of COVID. <clears throat> the fourth key is this idea that we don't need to be an expert in order to help support a student who is going through alarm and anxiety. Most individuals don't need to have somebody who specializes in that to be supported. Caring adults can be enough. Um, and so 
there's research that has shown after um, the 9-11, they did a a study to to compare two groups of one who were supported by a crisis intervention specialist who were supported after um, losing a loved one and so forth. And the other group was uh, observed where they didn't have any specialists in crisis intervention and they were just surrounded by their family, by their loved ones. And they actually realized that those that are um, that were with their loved ones actually did better and bounced back better, had better resilience and so forth. And so you got to believe in the relationships that you have with the students, who you are to the student matters. It's not about being an expert and knowing all of this information. It's not about uh, having any type of therapeutic approach. It really is about creating that safe space for students. And so when we think about the word anxiety, um, a lot of different terms can come to mind. Um, Of course, an anxiety disorder could be a term that comes to mind. Um, Any type of worry, panic, uh, nervousness, uh, fatigue, um, and so forth. And so there's so many different words that can come out when we're talking about the term anxiety. Um, But again, the piece that I want to focus on is the foundation of that, which is alarm. And we'll talk about that in in a moment. But before we talk about that, I just kind of wanted to cover really quickly some statistics to kind of situate a little bit. So these are are from Canada and they're from 2019, 2020. It's the last time the Statistics Canada um, pulled out some some, uh, more recent statistics. And so what they're saying Um, in terms of anxiety in youth in Canada is that just over 40% of Canadian youth between the ages of 15 to 24 have reported having excellent or very good mental health in the late March and early April 2020. So we're talking about right right up until COVID hit. Compared to 62% in 2018, so that was the last time that um, Statistics Canada did a study. So between um, 2018 and 2020, you can see that there has been a drop from 62% of students who were doing excellent and very good in their mental health to now going down to 40%. So you really can see statistically how, how COVID has had a big, big impact, whether directly or indirectly on students. So another survey that was conducted in March uh, to July 2020 have um, have, uh, come with the realization that 11.6% of students from 15 to to 34 year olds have reported an increase in their cannabis use um, and and it's higher than any other age group. And 18.7% of 15 to 34 year olds that have reported an increase in alcohol consumption. And so we can see in this age group how relying on substance use has been a way for for them to be able to cope with their mental state. A little little bit more statistics before we move on to the presentation. Over half, so 57% of participants between the ages of 15 to 17 reported their mental health as either somewhat worse or much worse than it was before physical distancing measures were implemented. And so we know that for high school students did get a larger impact from COVID than elementary students because elementary students went back to school much faster, whereas our teens stayed home much longer. Many of them stayed home um, by themselves for a long period of time, and especially when parents needed to go back to work. And so this isolation has been huge on them. And, and now we're looking at the short-term repercussions. We don't know what the, what the mid-long-term repercussions will be. Um, we're only you know, now moving into the, the short-term repercussions. So data from 2019 suggests that children um, are, um, already reporting mental health challenges may be particularly more vulnerable. And so 17% of five to 17 year olds have reported having a poor or fair mental, uh, mental health. 5% of five to 17 year olds said that they had been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And so these are students that have gone to seek professionals and have gotten a diagnosis for their anxiety. And 16% of men and 19% of women aged 15 to 34 said that they had seriously considered suicide. Um, and that we know, of course, that in men, um, the suicide is more, is more likely to result in death compared to, to the way that women um, can uh, go about it. Um, and so you can see the impact in terms of the substance use, in terms of the mental health capacity, and in terms of even uh, potential uh, suicide 
um, ideation and attempt. So <clears throat> if we go back to looking at it from a foundational perspective, um, understanding the, kind of how, how does it work in the brain? And so the main piece that plays into the alarm system is the limbic system. The, li the limbic system is what is responsible for, for emotions. And the two main key elements here are the amygdala. The amygdala is what registers the threat and kind of starts off the whole kind of sequencing in the body. So it sends a signal to the hypothalamus, which is right here in the brain. And then the hypothalamus is what orchestrates the response in the body. This is what actually um, pushes forward the sympathetic nervous system, where all of the, the hormones are being kicked off, the, the adrenaline, the cortisol, and so forth. And that's when, when the person is moved into flight, fight, freeze response. And so I mentioned before that there's a difference between alarm and anxiety. And so alarm is really the primal emotion at the foundation. So alarm is basically what the brain is, is um, sending as a signal to the body that you are in danger and now you need to move to caution to survive and to protect yourself. The difference between alarm and anxiety is anxiety is... Um, a vague sense of unsafety and unease that is characterized by apprehension and restlessness. So the alarm is something that we're more conscious of. It's something that pushes us in our body. Whereas anxiety is kind of like this, this ongoing vague sense of, of discomfort and sense of unsafety. And so oftentimes when students are, are experiencing anxiety on a daily basis, they have a hard time uh, making sense of that anxiety. And, and if they do give it an explanation, sometimes it's an explanation that makes the most sense to them, but it may not be the actual fact or the actual reality. Sometimes the brain needs to fill in the gaps in order to, for it to make sense. And sometimes the brain will go to the thing that's the most probable, but it's not an automatic or a given that the thing they believe that they are alarmed by is necessarily what is triggering them. So, if we're talking about alarm, which is really the, the, you know, the primitive emotion there, understanding that emotions are, is not something that we choose. It's not something that we decide. It's not in our control. It stirs us up. It happens to us as opposed to us choosing this or us being in control of it. It is irrational, although the brain has its reasons. I mean, understanding that each emotion has a purpose um, and so understanding that <clears throat> the feelings of alarm are there to protect us from danger. And so, of course, if we had to think about whether or not we were in danger, perhaps this would already threaten our survival capacity. And so the brain doesn't take the time to reflect. It is all in survival mode and in, in, re in automatic reaction. And then we think about it. And so it's, it makes sense that the brain has its reasons and so oftentimes reasons is the survival piece, but understanding that it's not necessarily rational. The other piece is, is that emotions move us. They, they, they push us to react. They push us to express and so forth. Um, it kind of like where emotions ha have movement. And so if you think about, in, for example, in the, the alarm that is triggered in the brain, and then it's all orchestrated through the parasympath the sympathetic nervous system, where you've got the adrenaline and the cortisol, and then you're in flight, fight, freeze response. And so the emotions are kind of pushing you to react um, in order to survive. Now, <clears throat> If we are in a situation that is not threatening to our safety, oftentimes we may be alarmed by something that we're able to, to um, capture or that we're able to be conscious of or to recognize. And so if we, all, if we do have a very healthy alarm system, we will be able to name what is happening to us. And so let's say, for example, a student is um, you know, afraid of failing a test. And so they're able to talk about the fact that the, the um, learning situation or the evaluation situation is something that is very um, stressful for them, very alarming. And so they may say something like, I'm nervous, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to fail, I'm scared about the situation. And so this is what we want. This is the, a healthy working you know, alarm system where on the foundation you've got all of the, 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 the physiological responses that are happening but then you also have the alarm and then there's a connection to the thought, the, the, the reflection where we're able to talk about how we feel. 
And so the, the natural sequence of things is that, you know, and understanding, as I mentioned before, that our body can't think first because then this would threaten our safety. We're supposed to react first. And so it's the chemistry of the body that kicks off the whole sequencing. And then the chemistry of the body through the, the parasympathetic, the sorry, the sympathetic nervous system then kicks off the body into flight, fight, freeze. And then you have the feeling. So the feeling to go back to that about I'm scared, I'm worried, I'm nervous. And then you're able to perceive the situation. And so all of this is done in that, in that direction. And so the reason why I'm talking about this is because there's a lot of literature out there that focuses on thinking. And if we have positive thinking, then we would be able to, to um, kind of put ourselves at ease and to be able to uh, talk ourselves out of a situation, but it's not that simple. We really need to understand that the brain is done from a very primitive part of the, of the, of this primitive part of the brain and that it's all about chemistry and about the, the, the physiological portion of the body. And so it's not that easy to be able to control ourselves. I mean, even us as adults, you know, how often we get caught in situations where, I don't know, we see a snake and how we may react to that, or that we may, if we're afraid of heights, that we're in a place where it's really high and we're very, you know, afraid of, of being in that situation. And even if we talk ourselves through it, it doesn't mean that we're not afraid of that situation. And so understanding that it's not that simple in terms of being able to, to control that. The other piece that's really important to understand is that, yes, you've got the limbic system that, that kicks off the whole, um, the whole alarm portion, but in order to talk ourselves through a situation and to be able to temper it a little bit, we need to have a good, well-functioning prefrontal cortex to have um, executive functioning capacity. And in order to have executive functioning capacity, you need to have developed that. This is not something that comes automatically with age. You could even know adults in your life that are, you know, chronologically are, are, are developed in their, in, their, in their bodies, but their brain, depending on the conditions that they grew up in, if they were, were caught in survival mode, thinking about, you know, students that have gone through trauma or thinking about, you know, very sensitive students that get easily overwhelmed by their emotions, this plays into how well prefrontal cortex can develop because if the brain is caught in overwhelm and in survival mode, developing the prefrontal cortex is actually a luxury. And so this is where we see the difference depending on the students that we work with, who are the ones that are able to have that inner dialogue with themselves and are able to find a way to kind of bring things down. And those that are in completely reactive mode and have no filter and, and have no capacity to connect their body and their reflection. And so what's happening there for those students is they don't have a good prefrontal cortex functioning. Now, research has shown that teen brains um, can have, a, to some extent, a good prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, but it's really not before young adulthood in your 20s until you've got the complete capacity to access your prefrontal cortex and to be able to use it to its best capacity. Um, the other piece that I should mention, too, is even if you have the potential of having the executive functioning to help have perspective and to bring things down, you need to be top shape to be able to access that capacity. So somebody who's too tired, who's sick, who's hungry, who's stressed out, who is, who's had a history of trauma, all of this plays into their capacity to not just develop the prefrontal cortex, but to be able to access it in that moment. So if we think about our very sensitive students, those students who live their emotions very intensely, these are students who are more easily affected and moved by their emotions because of the fact that they, they haven't had the opportunity to develop their prefrontal cortex to the same capacity as, as neurotypical students that has had good conditions to mature that part of the brain. And so these are also students that get easily overwhelmed by their emotional experience. And they also get quite stuck in that situation because the emotional intensity can evoke defenses. And so oftentimes these students have an armor on to protect themselves from their emotional experience because it's just too much to handle. Sometimes they will try to escape their emotions while they'll try to intellectualize the experience. And those are the students that have a really hard time adapting to difficult situations and to find their tears. The other piece too, that's really important for us to notice is that the adults that work with those students 
oftentimes try to put focus on calming a student who is who is emotionally intense because it can be quite um, disruptive. The emotional eruption can be quite intense. And so rather than trying to make space to invite the emotions, the adults are quick to try to shut it down, to try to calm the student, to try to bring them to, to uh, you know, them being happy, not focusing on their sadness and so forth. And, and so the stu those students don't feel understood, don't feel supported, don't feel invited in their emotions. Um, and so it makes it that much more difficult for them to be able to experience them and move, experience them and move them through. Now, I just wanted to stop for a second um, for, for those students that are neurodivergent. So we're talking about students on the spectrum. We're talking about students that are hypersensitive in any way, shape or form can have an impaired sensory gating system. The sensory gating system is basically at the stem of the brain. So if I go back to that image on the brain here, it basically is at the stem before hitting the limbic system. And what it does is that it <clears throat> takes in the, the stimuli from the environment. And so an individual who is neurotypical has a very well-functioning sensory gating system and are able to filter and to cut out the noise. And so it doesn't overwhelm their system compared to a student who's neurodivergent for whom even their everyday, you know, having, you know, the, 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 all of the senses. So think about light, think about sound, think about touch, Think about even the interoceptive, so how they feel hunger, how they feel pain and so forth. They feel things 10 times more and have a hard, harder time filtering all of that influx. And so it really does a number on their, on their limbic system because they're almost kind of completely, um, what's the word, hijacked in their brain uh, by that experience. And so it makes that their alarm system kind of, kind of get, kicks off so much more faster and more intensely than a neurotypical student. Similarly, uh, and I would love to do a presentation next year um, on trauma and kind of really focus in on this. So I'm really kind of skimming over this today, um, but understanding that, that uh, you know, children that, uh, and adolescents that have gone through traumatic situations, and especially if they've gone through trauma at a very young age. And so this is a comparison of a healthy brain compared to a brain that has gone through extensive uh, neglect and abuse from a very young, young age. And so you can see how it impacts the, the uh, neurons and the, the, the activity in the brain. Um, and so you can see that the prefrontal cortex is not as well functioning as the healthy brain. And you can see that the limbic system is very, um, very affected by that. And so for those students, not only is their amygdala decalibrated and reacts very intensely, very quickly, so that's one kind of handicap. On the other hand, their, their prefrontal cortex is also compromised. And, and so they, they don't have the capacity to be able to have inner dialogue and to be able to calm themselves down easily. And so you can see the double handicap for those students. And so instead of being able to have integrative capacity or cognitive refle you know, reflection, their brain is caught in survival and all they see is danger or they're, or they're searching for danger in their environment. So their brain is caught in their emotions and in their instincts. So I wanted to show you a graph for a second to kind of just illustrate it differently. Um, and so you can see the neurotypical student that has, has gone through, a, you know, a, a typical um, life condition. There hasn't been a history of trauma. And you can see here, um, so I'll explain the graph for a second. So from the left to the right, you've got daily challenges where that can put some stress into the body to moderate stress, to, to distress and threat. And so you, we, we go from less to more stress in the environment. And then from the bottom to the top, this is the reaction of the person going through the stress. And so you go from a state of being calm to a state of being alert, to a state of being alarmed, to a state of being fearful, to a, a state of being terrorized. So you can see that for a neurotypical child who hasn't gone through a history of trauma, um, go through the situation very proportionately. So the more that there's, there's challenge to moderate stress, to high stress, the more they react from being calm to being terrorized. But you can see for the, the sensitized adolescent and, and or child, even adults, so this kind of fits into any age category, 
um, how quickly in from daily challenge to moderate stress, how quickly their body reacts. And so this is the amygdala that because it's already decalibrated, it doesn't take much for it to be set off and to kind of send a dangerous signal to the rest of the system. Um, and, and of course, the rest kind of tips, kind of um, follows the trend afterwards that's similar to a neurotypical child who hasn't gotten through trauma at this point. But you could see at the bottom point how quickly it jumps. And now on the bottom part, and this is what we want to work towards, is those students that have built resilience. And so resilience is a key, is a key word that we often hear, you know, in the last couple of years, ever since, especially ever since COVID, there's a lot of li literature, a lot of research on, on how do we build resilience, what is resilience. We're going to be talking about that in the presentation. But what I wanted to show you is that for students who have built good resilience, even though they may be sensitized, they have been able to now tolerate much more, much more easily to, to experience daily challenges and moderate stress. And of course, when you get to the point of distress and threat, it's their reaction is completely normal at this point. But what we want, especially those that work in the school system, you know, being in the classroom and being confronted with learning situations and evaluations and such, we want them to be able to cope in the classroom. This is the ideal. And so this is what we want to work on. So rather than having the student that reacts very intensely, what we want is for them to be able to manage and to tolerate staying in the class. So what triggers emotional expressions and emotional expression here we're talking about alarm and so what triggers alarm so i'm going to be giving you a few examples that are typical of children and of adolescents and some of them are specific to adolescents um, and so kind of just to give you a context as to what are the typical things that can impact our alarm system and so one huge one is when we're faced with what we call separations. And separations can, can be in at so many levels. And so talking about um, feeling rejected, feeling that we don't belong, that we are different, um, that we've got a threat to our identity, that um, we're not being liked, that we feel we're feeling betrayed, not feeling understood, not feeling important, being neglected. There's so many different elements. At a and, and I'm not talking about trauma right now. I'm just talking about like regular adversity in, in somebody's daily experience. How this can have, you know, if it's especially if it's done chronically, how this has an impact on the alarm system. And so, separation is basically the attachment threat, and we need to understand that attachment is actually our preeminent need. It is the most important need to the human species but it also means that it is the biggest threat for us. And so, so much research has been done out there on the impact of separation. Um, <clears throat> and that has shown how this has, has created alarm and stress and, and anxiety over time with people. I'm just gonna take a step for a second. This graph here, for those who have never seen it before, this is part of Gordon Neufeld's theory on attachment and talks about how there's six different ways that individuals attach to others. And this is not just for babies and children, this is for all of us, including adults. And so we attach by being together physically, we attach by having things in common, we attach by belonging, we attach by mattering, we attach through, um, through emotional intimacy, and we attach through psychological intimacy. But as much as these are ways for us to connect, these are also different ways for us to feel threatened by and, to, and for us to feel alarmed. And so I've put here together a graph to kind of give you an example by each level of attachment, how attachment can be threatening to our students. And so not being with, where students can feel alone, can feel that people aren't paying attention to them, that don't want to be with them, that they're, where they're feeling rejected, not feeling like they have anything in common with others. They feel that they're different, that they're not normal, that there's a prejudice against them. In terms of belonging, that they don't feel included, that nobody's taking their side, that nobody has their back, that people are against them. And so you could start thinking about all of these situations of students you're working with, how, you know, and if, if this happened here and there, it's one thing, but if these things happen on, on a daily basis or ongoingly, you can see the impact or the toll that it takes on the, on the system and on the body. 
not mattering. So feeling that you're not noticed, that you're not listened listen to, that you're not useful or important, that people don't respect you, that you're not feeling esteemed or admired, that your opinion doesn't matter, that you're and so forth. And not being loved, that you don't feel taken care of, don't feel the warmth from, from somebody else, feel unlovable. And the last one, not being known, so not feeling truly seen or heard, not feeling understood, that you can't share your secrets because there's consequences if you do, cannot truly be yourself, etc. And so there's so many different ways how this impacts. And this is just at one level. So now we're going to look at other examples of things that our teens go through on a regular basis that impacts their alarm system. Another one, which kind of, it, it doesn't in a way fit into the, the alarm, um, the attachment alarm, but it's the performance anxiety. And oftentimes we're not performing for ourselves, especially children and adolescents. Oftentimes they're, they're performing because they want to be, if I go back to the attachment roots, you want to, uh, to be important. You want to matter to somebody else. You want, to, you want them to be proud of you and so forth. And so there is a lot of focus on needing to do well at all costs, that you, you have to win, whether it's in sports or in academics, that you can't make mistakes. How many students that you work with that, that don't take risks, because if they do, what if they fail? What if they make a mistake? What if they get it wrong? And so, so many students are in avoidance uh, right now, and, and not just um, academic avoidance, but even school avoidance. I have so many cases of that trying to be perfect all the time, which is impossible, but the pressure that adolescents put onto themselves. Now, for those who have seen the first presentation that I did in December on uh, the adolescent journey, this will be familiar to you, where a um, typical part of the adolescent journey is that as you're trying to develop your sense of self, in order for you to be able to do that, you kind of put a bubble around yourself where you become very egocentric, where you become very self-concerned, very self-conscious, where you know adolescents feel that it's all it's always about them, that everybody's harder on them than to other people, that uh, it only matters what they think, that everybody's looking at them, that self-consciousness that they have. I can't do that, I'll look stupid. I can't wear that at school, everybody will laugh at me. And so being in that mode of being self, self-absorbed, self-concerned and self-conscious adds on to the stress onto the system. Um, and so <clears throat> adolescents have many different feelings, feelings where now they're growing up and they're becoming in the, into their own because they're slowly and surely going from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And that's really exciting to get all of these freedoms and such. But at the same time, it's scary to be changing and that all of a sudden, yes, you have you have responsibilities. And now, you know, you, you, you may feel that your parents are not as close to you anymore or, or that you feel like your environment's changing around you and so forth. And so there's a lot of of, of experiences with our adolescents where they're seeing their, their, their world change and how this brings on alarm for them. Um, again, going back to that, that, that um, self-consciousness and so forth, where they feel that people are looking at them, judging them, uh, where everything around them um, seems to be too much to handle um, and so forth. Um, the loss and the grief where things are, are yes, changing, um, and are, but are becoming more complicated too. It's, you know, little, you know, when you're, when you're young, you have little problems. When you're older, you've got bigger problems and, and being confronted with all of these big problems that seem to be that much more complicated. And the other piece that, that belongs very much to the um, experience, the journey of the adolescence is the, the sense of aloneness feeling that people don't understand them, don't get the, don't get them, that uh, they're, they feel kind of very much in their, own, in their own world or in their own kind of isolation because of the fact that they don't feel like people understand them. Um, and what goes hand in hand with that too is discovering who they are. And do they like every part of themselves? Are there, are there things about themselves that they're ashamed of or embarrassed of and want to keep hidden? And at the same time, you know, you want to become your, yourself and you want to discover yourself, but then you've got the pressure of having to fit in and, and all of the threats about being different. Um, you know, this goes back to that, that attachment route here about being different. Um, and so all, a lot of this in adolescence, there's huge peer pressure about trying to conform and to fit in. Um, and so at, on the one hand, the, you know, there, there's a curiosity where you want to develop yourself. 
but on the other hand, you've got the pressure of, of needing to be liked and such. And so, you know, this is very hard for the adolescent who's newly going through this at this, at this level, given their development. The other piece that's huge is peers, right? Um, and, and so a conflict is a big one where, of course, they've gone through this to some extent at, a, at the elementary level, but at the high school, there's a whole other level of, of navigating friendships and navigating social media and all of the conflict that can come with that and the pressures that come with this. And um, same thing with peer pressure. Um, you know, so on the one hand, wanting to explore, but then also, you know, and trying to put those limits and those boundaries, but having the pressure about needing to fit in and taking those risks and being you're putting yourself out there and all of that kind of dissonance that our adolescents are going through, where on the one hand, uh, they want to be with their friends and to, and to fit in, but on the other hand, not feeling comfortable with some of the things that they experience. Um, in terms of social media, I kind of alluded to that a little bit. And so this is, this is new to some of these generations. I know for myself, um, you know, when I was an adolescent, uh, social media was not out to the same level as it is now. And so our adolescents are being confronted with social situations very differently than when we were growing up. Um, you know, for them, and all of, of this experiences online and, uh, and the way that these apps are, are built, um, you know, there, there's been some statistics out there about the impact of social media. And so you can see for students that we're talking about how they feel this, that social media is positive to it being, um, you know, somewhat from positive to negative to being mostly negative. Um, you can see how many students are quite concerned about social media because of bullying or rumor spreading. And that's the biggest one in terms of harms that it can bring to relationship and in-person contact. Uh, you know, how many adolescents that you're working with um, tend to have a social life more on the screen than they do in the real world um, and how this has an impact in their day-to-day -day real world experiences, the unrealistic views of other people's lives. I mean, we know with the filters and with all of these things, the, the, the pressure about trying to, to come up to par of these, these false expectations um, how, you know, some of the social media can cause distractions and addiction. Peer pressure is part of it. The, you see there is mental health issues. And so even teens are saying that social media can push mental health and, and bring in drama just in general and so forth. Um, and so this is a whole other level where this has an impact. And so we went from talking about attachment, you know, the threat of attachment, talking about fitting in, talking about um, the typical adolescent experience about being self-conscious, um, talking about navigating conflicts, talking about peer pressure and social media. So you can see all of the different elements that come into play. And I haven't even talked about even um, the pressures from, from being a student, from being successful at school, from learning situations, how vulnerable that is for some, some, of, some of our students that have learning disabilities and so forth, and all of that could, that can play into it as well. So when does alarm become a problem? Because I mentioned before that alarm is natural and normal. We're all meant to have, to some, to some extent, a, a level of stress. And so the, it's not the alarm in itself that's a problem. It's when it, it, it kind of moves forward in the continuum where there's more defenses. And so the, the part of it is that when our students are going through daily stressors, they are coping to some extent, but at some point for some, of our, for some of the students that we're working with, it just becomes too overwhelming. It becomes an environment that is way too wounding. It becomes a sensory or emotional ex experience that becomes too overwhelming. And at that point, our students are now starting to put on these armors to protect themselves where they're they're putting the armor or, or they're they're having you know the prickly of the of the porcupine where they're numbing out some of their emotions to not feel too much where they're tuning out into certain situations social situations especially because it, it is too hard to see these things it's too wounding and and where it gets at the worst of the continuum is where now the students are starting to back out of relationships and isolate themselves they're starting to avoid certain social situations because it just becomes too hurtful the other piece that I should be talking about as well, that is another um, cause for concern um, at adolescence is, is the, the temptations to avoid feeling. 
Um, and, and, and again, because of social media and screens, um, students have um, a much easier time now to um, find different outlets and different ways to distract themselves and, and kind of avoid facing reality where they hide into their, their screens, hide into um, their music, into their shows, into their whatever it is that they're watching. Um, and, you know, not that, not that uh, entertainment in itself is an issue. The, the, the issue is taking it to the nth degree where now it becomes the complete distraction. So if we go back to the analogy of the iceberg, when um, this is the healthy alarm system where we're feeling all of our, of our emotions, we're able to talk about them, name them, recognize them. Now, if we, if we focus on a student who is numbing themselves out and tuning out from, from the situations, what happens is that the brain has now put a, a, a kind of like a blockage there to not feel your emotions because it's too hard to experience them. The brain protects and suppresses the emotions However, it's not because you don't feel your emotions that your emotions are still not activated in your system. So you still have the adrenaline and the cortisol and the, the physiological flight, fight, freeze response in your body, but you are kind of disconnected from your body where you're not able to be conscious or to name or to recognize what's happening in your system. And so that's the difference between alarm and anxiety. So anxiety, you have all of the um, reactions in your body of alarm, but you are not feeling your emotion. So it's something that is kind of like this ongoing unease, but you're having a hard time putting your finger on it. And oftentimes what happens because the body is being pushed by the adrenaline and the cortisol and such, there isn't a discussion about how, how you feel, but there is a whole slew of different reactions that are coming from the body where you're not feeling safe, where you're engaging into certain anxiety reducing behaviors. For example, I'll just get into the next slide. So for example, um, you know, taking drugs, taking alcohol, for example, getting into certain fixes, um, getting into, um, you know, different things like nail biting, uh, chewing, and so forth. Um, it could be certain types of emotional playgrounds that you get yourself into if you're not too defended it might just be something like music and drama but if you're so defended it might get to where now you're seeking adrenaline and so that's like the other continuum um so if we go back to uh, to this list and um, having ruminating thoughts where you have the, these thoughts that keep on popping to your head of course you're having a hard time learning because you're not able to focus and you're caught in hyper vigilance um, nightmares can be part of that, having a hard time sleeping, having scattered attention, being agitated, having tension in your body, being hyper, uh, poor memory, having fatigue, phobias, having obsessions. This is, this is where the anxiety starts going further into the continuum, uh, where phobias can pop up, obsessions and compulsions, panic attacks. Uh, acting out of control, not being controlling, and so forth. And so this is not an exhaustive list. It was just meant to give you an idea of, of different things that can come out. So understanding that the way through is not about addressing the symptoms. It's about trying to remove the defenses there to be able to, to bring it back to a healthy place where we can talk about it. So um, how can we help teens cope? And so this analogy that I, that I really love is when a flower doesn't bloom, we fix the environment in which it grows and not the flower. And so the idea here is understanding that alarm is a natural and normal reaction. It's not about stopping the anxiety. It's about trying to set up the environment where we can help the student feel safe, build their resilience, and then they'll have a better capacity to be able to face their stress and, and alarming situations and their everyday circumstances. So the key to addressing anxiety is not about stopping the anxiety. It, it, it is about building the re resilience, which means that it's not that we're not having a hard time, is that we're able to bounce back from the situation and we don't get stuck in it. And so there's three main keys in order to address, um, to, to build resilience. The first one is to, to build a sense of safety with the student. The second one is to create an environment where they can express their emotions. And the third one is how can we help them discover their sense of courage? And so, as I mentioned, resilience 
is, is the capacity to bounce back to up to optimal optimal functioning. So it's not that we're not that we're having an easy time. It's, so it is difficult to face stressing situations, but that we're able to bounce back from that. So I want to walk through each of the different keys. So, <coughs> sorry, I'm just going to take a sip for a second. So how can we build a sense of safety when the student is faced with adversity? By helping them feel accompanied and supported. And so in order to help a student feel safe enough when they're faced with their stressful and wounding situations, and key word here is enough. It's not that we want to make them feel completely safe. That's, that's not realistic. It's about giving them the sense of safety enough where they're able to kind of relax and to be able to be at rest with us. And so this is done through the presence of a warm and trusting adult where, where the teen is able to experience some emotional rest. Remember the study that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation where I said that during 9-11, those that were accompanied by their loved ones did better than those that were accompanied <coughs> by specialists in crisis intervention. So it's not about knowing information and being an expert in the domain. It's about being that trusting person that the student can feel safe with and is able to um, spend time with, to be able to talk to and, and, and exchange and so forth. And so if they're able to spend time with that, with that warming, trusting adult, and they're able to not just experience well-being in the, the presence of that adult, they're also able to, to um, put out there their feelings and their thoughts, whether it's by talking about it or by doing this through a, a, a more kind of indirect mode uh, using um, alternative approaches like art, like music, any type of creative activity can be a way to release. Journaling can be one. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a list of different examples, but these are things that we can help the student uh, uh, to be able to put out there and to feel what is to feel safe. One thing that's really important for me to name here is that a sense of safety is not something that the adults decide. It's not because we believe that the students in a safe place or with a safe adult that they necessarily are feeling safe. This is something that is subjective to the teen's experience. It's, it is a, a <coughs> interpretation of their own experience. And so really honoring space for them to be able to say to you or that you get to see in their nonverbal if they're truly feeling safe in that moment or not. And so just to go back to that safety piece, here's another way to look at it. And so when students are feeling overwhelmed and are putting up the defenses, so this is similar to, this is another way of looking at the analogy of the iceberg where we're putting up the defenses. And so <clears throat> when students are, are overwhelmed and putting up defenses, now they're stuck development developmentally and they're not feeling their emotions and this leads to learning and behavior problems and so rather than addressing the learning and behavior problems directly we're going to look at how can we how can we reverse that situation and so what we're going to do is rather than, than attack it up here we're actually going to start with relational support and with relational support now students will feel safe and this will help reduce the emotional defenses now emotions will, will be felt, healthy development will happen, and in turn, this will be the resolution to the learning and behavior problems. And of course, the, the learning and behavior problems that will result of the defenses. Of course, if a student has a learning disability, you know, for different reasons, that may, of course, will not be addressed. We're talking about things that have been provoked because of emotions. One of the pieces to keep in mind in terms of creating an environment of safety is thinking about how can we do things, do things preventatively. So rather than waiting that the student gets completely overwhelmed and disorganized, and that's where we step in and put things in place, let's put things in place ahead of time. Let's create a plan where students have <clears throat> plan A, plan B, plan C, and, and where they can do things preventatively. So students typically don't respond well in a crisis intervention, and it's quite difficult to make headway in those circumstances because they're not dis in, they're indisposed and they're not receptive when they're under stress, and it's difficult to engage them. They're disconnected and not accessible. 
So student success depends on, yes, their sense of safety, building the attachment, having a structure, a routine, a predictability, um, being able to introduce their tools and their supports and be able to practice them preventatively. So if we're going to be using journaling, we don't wait for the student to be disorganized to introduce the journaling. We do this when the student's in a good place we may want to set up a check-in with that student where in the morning when they come into school, first thing they do is to come and see you and to talk to you rather than waiting to get to, that they're disorganized. And at that point, they're no longer receptive to that check-in. And so you want to do things ahead of time. Maybe it might be that for that student for a certain subject area or for a certain time of the day that we schedule a break for them ahead of time so they know that at that time they get to have a break somewhere, let's say with the tech in, in, you know, in another space in the building and so forth. And so thinking preventatively. The other piece that's really important to name in terms of safety is, is the dynamic between the student and the adult. And, and it's about for us to keep in mind, where is the student at in their stress curve? Are they receptive to us in the moment or are they completely disorganized in that moment? And it's not just about looking at the student's stress curve, it's also to look at our own. So where are we on that scale? Are we in a place where we are in a, in a good place to be able to take on that student? Or are we ourselves being pushed around by the student's reaction and we need another adult to step in in that, in that point because we're being triggered and we're not in a good headspace. So it's, and, and it's not about blaming, you know, that, that you're not in that headspace. We need to honor that we're all human and that we get triggered by things and that's okay and that's normal. We're supposed to work at these situations as a team. And so those difficult students that are very highly challenging, it's not about giving the 100% responsibility to that one adult. It's about working at it as a team and that we're able to recognize that not just where the teen is at, but where are we in, in that space and can we intervene in a way where our own energy is very tempered and that will help also establish that sense of safety for the student because keep in mind that that student who's hyper vigilant what they're noticing from you is not what's coming out of your mouth it's not what you're saying it's your nonverbal, your paraverbal if you're talking too fast if you've raised your voice if you're if if um you know the way that your eyes are or the way that you're you're positioned yourself all of that plays into whether the student feels safe or not with you. And so this is like so important to keep to keep this in mind. In terms of the second key um, is talking about emotional expression. And so how can we set up th these, this environment for them to express their emotions? I think first of all, um, th the idea is can the adults come alongside the student's feelings? Can we accept their existence even though they're irrational or unreasonable? Can we normalize these experiences um, rather than trying to, to treat them as a problem? Can we make room for the feelings rather than trying to get rid of them? Being careful that we're not judging those emotions, being careful that we're not discounting them, that we're not conveying to the student that they're too much to handle or that we're focusing on solving the problem. In that moment, your sole focus is to make space for the student to express and to vent. Um, <clears throat> whether the child is frustrated or the child is just, you know, in avoidance because they're alarmed, step one of emotional health and maturity is actually expression. Oftentimes adults go too fast and they jump too many steps. And what they're focusing on is can the student reflect on their, their emotions and being able to temper them to be able to self-regulate. What we're saying is this comes last. Step number one is establishing safety and to invite emotional expression. Step number two is to be able to name those emotions. Can we make sense of them? Can we recognize them? Can the student feel safe enough to be able to feel their emotions? And only once these three steps happen, can now the student have what they need to be able to temper and to reflect on that. And so short term, your job is to help them let it out, is to help them vent if they need to vent, or if, if they're in a place where, where tears want to come out, we want to make space for those tears. Understanding that adaptation and resilience is an emotional process. This is not a rational process. This is not something we think through. This is something we feel through. So the emotional process by where 
we uh, it, it's it's an inner transformation where it's the sadness and the tears that that allows us to accept and to adapt to that situation that we cannot change. And so if we go back to that idea of emotions having having emotion, and even the word says it, emotion is having motion in, in it. And so the idea is, can we make space for the emotion to move? And once the emotions go down and there's a sense of sadness and grieving, only then can there be a bounce back. And so I'll show you a different picture just so you can see the opposite. And so if we are trying to go at it from a rational perspective and we're trying to focus on being positive, trying to find being calm, trying to look for happiness, what we're doing is we're going against stream. We are trying to work against the, ne the natural order of emotions. And so the idea is not to try to work against it, it's to work with it. And that's the difference between a, a, a true resilience and a pseudo resilience. And so pseudo resilience, and there's so much literature out there that doesn't explain resilience well. Resilience is not about coping. It's not about managing and powering through. It is actually about feeling your vulnerability and allowing the emotions to come out, feeling the sadness come out. And it doesn't have to be tears necessarily, but to be able to be in touch with your emotions, which is very vulnerable and very chaotic at times. But this is what true adaptation and resilience is. It isn't about being tough and about trying to cope through. It's about being vulnerable and allowing for the emotions to come out. Now, not all students are able to experience their emotions directly. It is way too vulnerable and, and uh, overwhelming for them. And so I mentioned ha having the, the play mode. And so being able to use dance and movement, journaling and poetry, sketchbooking, uh, music, music, singing, photography, any kind of hobby that's, that students can use in order to help release those emotions in a creative way, uh, a theater is a huge one um, where you're, you're, you're experiencing, you know, your character's emotions, but your brain doesn't know the difference between you crying, pretend cry because you're, you're acting versus actually crying for your own life. It's the same thing when you're watching a movie. When you watch a really sad movie and you're, and you're crying about the story, it's not your story, but, your brain, but then you feel relieved after and you feel better. That's why. It's because you're letting the emotions come out indirectly, but the brain can make the difference between direct and indirect. Um, <clears throat> and so play, and I don't mean play in terms of playing with dolls, I'm talking about being in the play mode is really the neural exercise to help the, the, the system regulate itself. It's a practice for, it's a practice for the muscles. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I just want to make sure that we cover the last section, which is about helping them discover their, sen their sense of courage. But I do want to say to you that, uh, you know, as an adult working with teens in, in the school, if you can work on the first two, which is establishing a sense of safety and helping them release their emotions, you are doing already so much that this is not something you need to work at. This is something that you just need to help kind of create the opportunities. Where you're, and so understanding that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is that you're able to have enough desire that even though you're afraid of the situation, you, you would still face it. So, for example, um, you know, a student is avoiding engaging into an activity um, because they, they um, you know, they're afraid of that, of that situation. But can we find their desire in order to um, be able to move forward in that? Um, and so I'll invite you guys to take a look at this slide. And there's examples here of different desires to help temper and trump the alarm that our students are, are going through. Please keep in mind that in order to have courage, you need to be able to have a good prefrontal cortex functioning. And so if you have an immature student that is very untempered, it's difficult for them to see both sides of the equation. They're very caught into their one emotion. And so not only do you have, you need to have good prefrontal cortex functioning, you also need to be in a situation where things are safe and calm in that moment to be able to have that dialogue and to see both sides of it. And so the role of the adult is to adjust our view, understanding that alarm is a universal emotion that we, we all contend with and that it's natural and normal. Acknowledging that alarm happens to all of us as opposed, uh, that happens to us 
as opposed to under our control. Adjusting our stance that not alarming our teens with their own fears and frustrations or disapproval. Normalizing the experience of alarm rather than trying to avoid it or trying to fix it. Making room for their thoughts and feelings. And even though these are things that are very uncomfortable. So I invite you to go and take a look at our website. I do have some more resources on our website on anxiety and so forth. Um, they're not necessarily specific to adolescents, but please know that, you know, emotions are emotions regardless of the age. Um, and so um, I'll stop sharing. And so it's not a question of, um, you know, ch child versus adolescent versus um, adult. It really is the same emotion regardless of the age. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming to this presentation. Um, if you do have any questions, um, I can stay back for a minute or so um, and answer any questions. If you can't stay, um, please, by all means, um, write to me. You can put in, uh, I'll put my email into the chat. It's uh, ccora at rsb.qc.ca. And I would love to hear from you, by the way, given that this is my last presentation for the year on adolescence, I'd love to hear from you to know are there other presentations that you'd love to hear on another theme for next year? So I'll stop recording.